Holy Gospel this morning comes from St. Matthew in the fourth chapter. Well, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Well, then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him in the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, But again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, because it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Well, then the devil left him, and suddenly the angels came, and waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. So during this uh, season of Lent, uh, we are uh, gathering together here as a congregation and and committing to see if if we can, during these uh, 40 days of Lent and six Sundays, so for 46 days, say uh, the Lord's Prayer at least once a day. Uh, that's sort of our, our commitment. There are tons of spiritual practices available to us, uh, but we're going we're gonna to see if we can make a commitment to pray the Lord's Prayer at least once a day. Now, granted, you'll be good on the Sundays because we pray it here, so you'll be good. Uh, but the rest of the time, you try to say the Lord's Prayer. Now, somebody did say to me, well, I already say the Lord's Prayer every day, and I'm like, well, see if you can say it twice. Squeeze it in somewhere else uh, where you can say the Lord's Prayer. And so one of the things to remember about prayer is that it is a way in which we stay uh, connected uh, to God. And so when we we gather together to intentionally pray or to say the Lord's Prayer, however you do it, whether you do it in your room or whether you do it at the kitchen table or in your car or whatever it might be, uh, it's an intention that tries to improve uh, the communication between you and God. And so it, it, it's not designed, you know, to, to make sure that all of a sudden you've sort of, you know, crossed everything off on your checklist, but rather it's a way in which you, and you, you, re, you respond to God's grace and to God's love uh, by trying to stay in communication. I mean, it's really no different than how we do communion itself. Communion is, is here and given to us by God's grace and love, but it, it takes at some level of, of, of an intentional peace or commitment to get up in the morning, especially this early in the morning, uh, you know, to be able to uh, come forward or to have the communion elements brought to you. Uh, so there, there is a certain level where we're going to try to do that with the Lord's Prayer. But it's, it's not designed to sort of make us feel proud about ourselves as if somehow we accomplished something because we said the Lord's Prayer but rather it's a way to which we can open ourselves up to God and to say to God, God, what it, what, what's in store for me today? What's going on? Because never, rem- never forget that when you're praying the Lord's Prayer, God has been in constant motion since the beginning of time. And you're jumping into the stream of a very long story. And the communication that you're bringing to God when you say, Our Father who art in heaven, is not something that you're, you're starting anew, but rather filling in for something that's been going on for a long time. And there are, as I said, other spiritual practices. So, for example, today, Jesus takes one of the great spiritual practices uh, to, the, uh, to the extreme. Uh, he, he decides that what he's going to do for his, his communication with God is he's going to go out into the desert and he's going to fast from eating and drinking for 40 days and nights. Now, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I personally uh, have tried fasting over the years. Um, you know, it, it, it's doable, but I just want you to know that of all the spiritual practices I could have had us do, I did not choose fasting. I cho- chose the Lord's Prayer. So every time you're eating that bacon cheeseburger, said, thank you, Pastor Scott. But what Jesus is doing is, 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 is he's, he's, he's in one of these spiritual practices where he's intentionally trying to commune with God, but the story that we have, of course, is, is not him communing with God or communicating with God, it's, it's communicating with temptation or what's called in the story and in our lives, Satan. 
So all of a sudden, temptation comes up. And we're like, well, no, we're supposed to be doing communion or fasting or praying, and, and we're going to have all these things. I mean, it's, it's, it's not going you know, to ruin your salvation or ruin my day. If, if I ask you, you know, to say, how did you, did you say the Lord's Prayer today? And you say, you know what, I really, I forgot. I, I, it's not part of my regular practice. I have to actually make a post-it note or I have to put a message uh, notification on my phone or something because it's not part of it. And then if it happens, it just, you just forget. I mean, that's just what happens. Life just kind of piles on. And so Jesus is out in the desert here trying to figure out how am I going to you know, do this particular ministry that I'm called to do, and he's hoping that God will come in and say, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, here's what you're going to do. Here's what you, you, know, you need to say. Here's the stuff. And instead what he gets is Satan coming along saying, listen, <laughs> trust me, brother, it's a lot easier to commune with God when you're having a steak. Have something to eat. Jesus is like, oh, no, 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 no. And he's like, okay, well, listen, it's a lot easier to commune with God if you have God's angels carrying you. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. And, and, and so we find ourselves then constantly being bombarded in our spiritual practices, as good as our intentions might be. We constantly find ourselves bombarded by these particular temptations that we all face, our own or Jesus. So you might think, well, how did Jesus ever come up with anything? Well, here's the interesting piece. The, the, the text that uh, Gene read for us from Isaiah is actually quite a famous text because what happens is, is that in Jesus' life, once he gets done with the temptations, the temptation story, he goes to church, goes to synagogue. Now, this is a spiritual practice as well. Like I said, we're doing it today, we're coming to the table. This is a huge, time-tested spiritual practice. As one of my professors always used to say, the church does not have a mission, but it's pretty clear that God's mission includes the church. So what happens is, is that Jesus goes to church. And in church, they had a thing where they, in, the, in Jesus' time, when you went to the synagogue, that uh, you would, you, you'd, somebody would pass around the Bible and it, you'd open it up and you'd read something out of it. And it just so happens that they pass the Bible to Jesus. Now, he's just come back from not eating or drinking, spiritually tempted by the devil and all these things. He's finally sitting back home, and he was just hoping, like most of you, to sit in the back and just hope the pastor doesn't notice. You know, I just want to relax. I'm sure they'll say something nice, but I don't really want to focus on it. All right, there's stuff to do. It's going to be a gorgeous day. I only got half the garage cleaned. I still got to go down into the basement and get all that stuff out of the way. Then I've got a couple of kids that I got to be in touch with, and I'm sure there's something the grandkids got to do. So as long as Pastor Scott continues to ramble on for a good 15, 20 minutes, I should get my list complete by the time he's done. That's all Jesus wanted until they handed him the Bible, and he opened it up to Isaiah 61. And when he opened it up at Isaiah 61, all of a sudden, all the stuff that he had heard in his life to that point, everything that he had focused on while he was out in the desert for 40 days and nights, crystallized, and he knew exactly, he knew exactly what God was calling him to do. And so he read from Scripture that the Lord has come to bring good news to the oppressed. The Lord has come to replace our ashes with garland. And he closed the book, and he handed it on, and he said to his friends, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. <clears throat> that God came to Jesus, not when he was out in the desert and hoping to see something special, but when Jesus was sitting in the midst of the synagogue with family and friends, trying to just figure out what God had asked him to do, it was then that it became crystal clear what his mission was and his purpose was. And you and I, 2,000 years later, live off that mission and purpose that Jesus Christ has brought to the world. Through the prayers that Jesus has inaugurated in his own life, he's called all of us to live with him. And just as we were baptized into a death like his, we rise to live in a life like his. To be able to live, to be with those who are on the margins, those who are sick or quarantined, those who don't have any family or friends, those who are vulnerable, those who are seeking shelter, those who are seeking help or food. This is the call that Jesus found in his own life and which he now shares with all of us. 
And the Lord's Prayer is our way of jumping into that story of Jesus Christ brought to us in the world. But the temptations, the temptations will always be there to find ways in which we can forget or, or neglect what God has asked us to do. Now years ago, and I think I can do this here, we don't have too many young people, but for those who are younger, you'll have to just Google this. But um, this was before the Berlin Wall fell down and before the fall of uh, what we knew as Eastern Europe. And uh, this was just a year or two before, and uh, there were some students who were studying to be uh, pastors in Prague, Czechoslovakia. And it, at that time, Czechoslovakia, this is 1989, uh, 88, excuse me, uh, and so at that time, Prague was, was a hotbed of political unrest uh, in Czechoslovakia. A lot of things were happening, and, and it was very hard to focus uh, for these uh, seven uh, students. Uh, they were all men on, on training to be pastors. So they, they, they wanted to be Lutheran pastors, and uh, very much so, and, and, but they couldn't focus on their training. So they, 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 the, the Lutheran Church in Czechoslovakia arranged to have the, the students come over to the city of Chicago and finish their training there. And it just so happened at that time, uh, because God has a wild and weird sense of humor, uh, that I was working in a Slovak church. <clears throat> so m the church that I was in at that time, you know, uh, half of our ministry was in Slovak, the other half was in English. And um, so a couple of the students, uh, because Czechoslovakia was at that time, uh, both the Czech Republic and Slovakia, they now, they're now separated, but you know, prior to 1990 they were together. And uh, so the two Slovak students in that seminary, uh, they came to worship with us on a pretty regular basis. And these were young men. They were in their late 20s. Uh, they, had, they had spent most of their life just kind of living these sort of pious European lives that had been forced under them by uh, Josef Tito, who was the dictator of Czechoslovakia during most of their life. And, uh, and, they, and, they, and they were just very, very, very humble, very, very pious young men. And... Um, and so they came to our church, and, and everything was, was fine, and, and they wanted not only to you know, study for ministry at, at the University of Chicago, but they also wanted to, uh, they also wanted to, to participate in church life, so they, they were part of our church. Well, it just so happens that, that we, uh, later on in the spring, we had scheduled a canoe trip uh, down the Manistee River out in uh, the state of Michigan, in one of the national forests out there, and uh, I said to the, the, the guys, I said, hey, would you really like an experience? You guys know how to canoe. They were like, oh, yeah, we know how to canoe. And I was like, all right, cool. Why don't you come with us? So uh, we had about 15, uh, 20 teenagers and these two uh, guys from uh, Czechoslovakia, and we, uh, we're all in these canoes. And we're canoeing down the, the Manistee River. Uh, they did not lie. They actually were pretty, pretty proficient in, the, in, in canoeing and all those sorts of things, um, at least much better than many of my teenagers were at that time. And um, so we, 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 we had a great time going down the river. Now, on the last day, I, I thought this would be really fun. So there was this little, little, little point in the, in the river here, and it was kind of a nice place. And I thought what we would do is we would have, we would have communion at, at this, and then when we were done, we would all just jump into the river. So kind of like a communion baptism thing. We'd say a prayer about our baptism, and then we'd always jump in the river. Now, it's early spring, river's conservatively 52 degrees. Might have only been 51, but it was cold. And so the plan was, was we'd all just kind of do communion, and then uh, we'd say a prayer, and then we'd say a blessing for baptism, and then we'd all just jump in the river and we'd swim. So, worked out great, celebrated communion, everybody got communion, said a prayer, everybody in, all of a sudden, you know, 15 teenagers go jumping into the river, some lasted all the way up to six or seven seconds, uh, most, most didn't. I did, we you know, didn't have to do anything. Our, our two friends from Slovakia, they jumped in. Uh, everybody was just freezing. It was a great time. Wonderful. So we're sitting there, and then we're drying off. And I, uh, and I say to one of the guys from Slovakia, I said, hey, what'd you think? He's like, you know, we came to America to avoid distraction so that we could, could study and we could focus on God. And I said, that's true. And he said, I was going great until all of a sudden there were 15 people celebrating communion in swimsuits. Ruined me for life. So I'm assuming somewhere in now Slovakia there's a Lutheran church that does not have communion in swimsuits. Poor guy. You never know what's going to distract you, right? 
You never know what, what is going what is to slip you off from your intention or from your focus with God. And so what happens is we say the Lord's Prayer is we don't worry if we don't get it right or if we forget a word or two or if we miss a day, but that we intentionally get back into the rhythm to say, all right, Lord, I missed yesterday, but I'm going to try it again and to keep going. Because the point of a spiritual practice is not to prove that we're somehow better than someone else, but rather it's to open ourselves up to the grace and love and mercy that God has given us and to find ways that we can live in that grace and mercy, not constricted by rules and regulations, but rather by freedom and love. And the hope that God has for us is that in that freedom and love that we experience from God, when we go through these doors, we share it with everyone we meet whether we're distracted or not. Amen.